Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to our Bold Prediction Seminar Series. I am Chris Gunter. I'm the Senior Advisor for Genomics Engagement here at the National Human Genome Research Institute, and I'm going to share with you a few introduction slides to tell you about what we're going to talk about today. So as you know, because you're here with me, uh, we have our Bold Prediction Seminar Series, which we are very excited to have you attending with us. So uh, uh, I want to make sure that you know that on the web page here at the bottom of the page, we can uh, you can go and view uh, all of our previous Bold Predictions, as well as uh, in a few days, the one that you're watching now. We really appreciate you being here with us. So uh, when we came up with our Bold Prediction Seminar Series, it was based on uh, what we saw in our our 2020 uh, strategic vision that our Human Genome Institute published, and that was released in Nature. I encourage you, obviously, to go look at that as well. Um, and we, at the end, stated 10 bold predictions, which we kind of knew were stretch goals. We really wanted to challenge the community in order to be able to look at those. And, and, and we want to work together to be able to attain those. So that's the box at the end of that vision. Um, again, if you haven't watched all of the uh, series, I encourage you to go look at them, particularly the first one where Dr. Green uh, sets the stage for uh, how we thought about these bold predictions and why we want you all to be engaged in attaining them with us. That's what we're hoping for. So this is, I can't believe it when I came up with the idea for the series that we are already at number nine. I hope you have enjoyed them as much as I have. I had high expectations and I have to say that they have been exceeded. Our speakers so far have been amazing and today is going to be even better, if you can believe that. Our two speakers, I'm so excited about having them with us um, and they are going to uh, tell us a little bit about their own work. So this is the format that we have here. I'll introduce them to you in just a minute. We have paired speakers. They're going to each talk for 20, 25 minutes. And then I'm going to talk a little bit with the speakers because I have a whole bunch of questions and, and excited about what they're doing. And then my colleague, Vince Bonham, is going to moderate what they're doing or have take questions from you. So again, today we're on uh, prediction number nine, which is that individuals from ancestrally diverse backgrounds will benefit equitably from advances in human genomics. Uh, and our speakers are going to uh, take that apart and tell us about uh, were we too bold or were we not bold enough? We're going to talk about that and we hope that you will weigh in in the Q&A um, and, and uh, tell us more about how you feel about that too. So again, my colleague Vince Bonham will moderate the questions uh, near the end. I encourage you to put your questions in the Q&A as we're moving along and now I'm going to introduce our two speakers here. Let me make sure I have their introduction. So first up will be Dr. Alicia Martin, who's an investigator at the Analytic and Translational Genetics Unit at Mass General Hospital. She's an instructor in medicine at Harvard Medical School and an associated scientist at the Broad Institute, affiliated with the Stanley Center for Psychiatric Research and the Medical and Population Genetics Program. Whew, that is a lot. Uh, as a population and statistical geneticist, her research examines the role of human history in shaping global genetic and phenotypic diversity. So you can see why we asked her to kick us off. And then our second will be Dr. Robert Wynn, who's the director and Lippmann chair in oncology at Virginia Commonwealth University Massey Cancer Center. He's also the senior associate dean for cancer innovation and a professor of pulmonary disease and critical care medicine at the VCU School of Medicine. And while he's there in all his spare time, he oversees a center designated by the National Cancer Institute as providing advanced cancer care, conducting groundbreaking research to discover new therapies for cancer, offering high quality education and training and engaging with the community to make advancements in cancer treatment and prevention equally available to all. And I cannot wait to hear what they're gonna tell us. So please, Alicia, Alicia, take it away. Great, thank you so much, Chris. And thank you um, to the entire team for giving me the opportunity to speak here. I'm very excited about this. Um, so I wanna get started by again, thanking NHGRI for these bold predictions. Thank you for the invitation, Chris and Vince for having this lovely event. And I just wanna kick off by saying, I think the essence of this is really genomics for all. We're trying to make genomics inclusive. That's our bold prediction. Um, and we'll get into more of what the bold prediction means, at least from my perspective. Okay, so this is the exact text uh, that Chris has already shown for the bold prediction. Individuals from ancestrally diverse backgrounds will benefit equitably from advances in human genomics. There's several different pieces of this that I think are really important to pull apart. So the first is what do we mean by ancestrally diverse backgrounds? And then we're gonna go into what do we mean by benefiting equitably in advances in human genomics? So we'll start with the ancestry piece. 
this is usually where I like to start in the first place. What do we mean by ancestrally diverse backgrounds? Well, I think many of you have learned from your biology classes and sort of just pop literature, uh, popular science, that humans are over 99.9% .9 identical, no matter where they're from. So our genomes are very, very comparable and very similar all across all of your different A's, C's, T's, and G's that make up your whole genome. Ancestry studies generally study the small fraction of our DNA that differs. So ancestry is determined purely by our genetics and purely by our ancestors. This means it's not the same thing as race or ethnicity or any other self-identified um, measures of your identity. Our ancestry patterns are determined by human history. So we have to look at this map to think about how humans originated and how they populated the globe. So from this map, you can, of course, learn that humans originated in Africa on the order of hundreds of thousands of years ago. Humans migrated from Africa into the Middle East, into Eurasia, into Oceania, and into the Americas. This map shows roughly when some of those migration events uh, may have happened based on archaeological evidence as well as genetic evidence. And this history is really important when we're thinking about genetic studies. Um, because humans originated in Africa, that means that the average African population has about a million more genetic variants than the average out of Africa population due to these migration events as humans migrated, migrating out of Africa took a subset of genetic variation with them as they populated the globe. So when we study ancestry, we usually look at common genetic variants that actually arose before humans started migrating out of Africa. So these common variants differ in frequency around the world, but most of these variants are actually shared across different populations. So I think it's really important that we think about ancestry as having no distinct boundaries. There's no categories in ancestry. Ancestry is a continuum. Um, and that's how we should really be thinking about ancestry. So the next part of this bold prediction is that genomics is going to be equitable in about a decade. So is this sort of a long shot? To set this up, I wanted to describe a little bit of our work and sort of where we are kind of benchmarking our progress right now. So we've looked at data from the NHGRI, from the GWAS catalog, that has looked at how many participants in genome-wide association studies are comprised of populations from different groups. So when we look at these studies, we can see that right now, or at least recently, about 80% of participants in these large-scale genetic studies are from populations of primarily European descent. And this is hugely out of step with the global population where European ancestry populations make up about 16% of the world's populations. So we're really a long ways off of this bold prediction right now. And perhaps even more problematically, if you look at the bottom part of this slide, it shows how this fraction has changed over time over the course of the past decade, decade and a half or so. So I started out in genetics around the beginning of this timeline, around 2006 or so, when our largest genetic studies had around hundreds to maybe at very most thousands of individuals in them. And now we're routinely seeing genetic studies that have millions of participants. And this is so exciting because it's enabled so much more deep insights into the fundamental mechan mechanisms in biology and also things like genetic risk prediction. However, if we look at how the representation of these different populations has changed over time, we see that we have not really changed in diverse population progress over the course of the past decade and a half or so. In fact, our diversifying progress peaked around 2014 or so in genetics, and since then has stalled or perhaps even slid in the wrong direction for diversifying progress. Now, if we wanna understand the genetics of disease, our key and fundamental ingredient is genetic variation. So if we're biasing our scope and we're narrowing in on less genetic variation, we're then destined to find fewer genetic associations. Now, why are we here? Well, genetic studies have really grown massively, as I mentioned, but they've grown most appreciably in European ancestry populations. So I'm just showing from the same study these charts of how different ancestry populations have varied in study size uh, for different studies that have been conducted. I would argue that the UK Biobank is a wonderful example that has a transformative access model, um, a breadth and depth of phenotyping that's been unparalleled and a uniformity in study design and genotyping that's really fundamentally changed how genetic studies are conducted. 
The earliest release of a lot of this information that coupled genetics and phenotyping data occurred around 2017 or so. And you can see that since then, our studies have just grown explosively in European ancestry populations while they've stalled and stayed about the same in other ancestry groups. So if we want to fundamentally change the composition of genetic studies, we need UK biobank-like resources designed in additional continents and in different ancestry groups. So a core question that my group and many others are interested in is how do ancestry study biases in genetics then impact the generalizability of our knowledge? There's a couple, I think, important considerations when we're thinking about this question. The first is that we really fundamentally expect the biology to be shared and the genetic variants that are contributing to that biology to confer the same effects in different populations. More specifically, the causal variant effects that impact disease should mostly be shared across populations. However, when we go back and think about the map of how humans populated the globe, this has implications on allele frequency differences, linkage to disequilibrium differences. There's far more complicated factors like environment and gene by environment interactions and other more complicated factors that also exist across these different populations. So really impact a lot of this. So genetics is so powerful and I can't think of a more rewarding field to be involved in, especially right now. Um, genetics can provide objective biomarkers that are really critically needed for a wide variety of diseases, especially those that are highly heritable. So I fundamentally see the two key main goals of genetics as providing biological insight into disease mechanisms, and then also assessing risk among individuals and providing us these biomarkers. So when we conduct our big genetic studies, we're usually taking a patient population, in a non-patient population or a controlled population, comparing DNA and then running a GWAS, looking at the associations between genetic variants and these diseases to identify whether there are associations with increased risk or protective factors at each spot in the genome. There's a huge challenge here though. There's tons of variants in the genome, many of which contribute to disease, and they all have pretty small effects for complex diseases that we're really interested in, like type 2 diabetes, heart disease, many different cancers, um, psychiatric disorders. So many of the highest priority and most prevalent um, diseases in society are highly polygenic, meaning many genetic variants contribute. So we don't know which variants are causal that we're identifying from GWAS. We just know what's associated. Um, that means that we have sort of an unknown number of needles in our haystack. For today, I'm going to focus on the latter use of genetics, assessing risk among individuals. So when we assess risk, we can identify those individuals who are more predisposed to having a disease because they have more genetic risk variants, and those individuals who are controls and have lower risk of disease because they have fewer genetic risk variants. But as you can see from this plot on the right, those individuals who have a high polygenic score versus those individuals who have a low polygenic score have widely overlapping distributions, which means it's really hard to say from DNA alone how likely someone is to have a disease. So a polygenic risk score simply predicts an individual's phenotype from their DNA. But this alone is really not enough information to go on. We need to know about a lot more information about their lifestyle um, and other factors that are gonna contribute to their disease risk. On top of that, those individuals who have a genetic risk score that's really, really high, so those individuals at the top say one percentile um, for disease risk from a genetic score are those that are going to have actually informative information from a polygenic score standpoint. There's a lot of exciting use cases for things like polygenic scores and thinking about how we might translate genetics and how genetics might be equitable in the future. So several use cases for things like polygenic scores include deep phenotyping scenarios. So we can't always measure other outcomes that we're interested in, and maybe a GWAS for something like schizophrenia is not the most useful to know because we don't actually have actionable outcomes for things like that. But there are a lot of measures that we can't measure, that we can't um, phenotype at large scales, but we might be really interested in from a treatment perspective. Things like phenotype severity, readmission rates to a hospital, drug response. Those are really hard to measure at sufficient scales to have really high power in a GWAS setting, but previous GWAS that we've conducted give us the tools to investigate how having a high polygenic score for something like type 2 diabetes then impacts long-term um, outcomes. Another area where these have been discussed is in clinical trials, 
which are of course very expensive. So polygen explorers are being investigated and um, used to try to um, identify those individuals who are at highest risk, which can then make clinical trials more efficient by targeting those individuals with the highest uh, predisposition to disease. And then the area that's being talked about the most and where uh, genetics may have the largest impact on uh, precision medicine are in um, preventative medicine. So this is where this is the most hype. This is also what's re gonna require the most work. But imagine polygenic scores and genetics being translated into areas like breast cancer, prostate cancer, um, cardiovascular disease. Companies and researchers are actively working on this. The last sort of scenario that people have been talking about this are in, for example, things like embryo selection. But some of these areas require societal conversations and need a little bit more thought before some of the more dubious scientific and ethical areas um, sort of run out of control. Okay, so where are we right now with genetics? This is an extremely promising and exciting biomarker. I can't think of any single lab test in medicine right now that can be so predictive of such a broad spectrum of disease. Your DNA is fundamental, fundamental to understanding your risk of different diseases. Um, but one of the biggest challenges to implementation of genetics and precision medicine is the core of this bold, uh, bold prediction, which is the fact that Eurocentric GWAS do not currently translate across different ancestry groups or across different populations. So for example, I took my team and I took uh, data from the UK Biobank and we looked at how well we were able to predict traits in European ancestry populations compared to underrepresented populations in the UK Biobank. And we did a far better job in the European ancestry groups than elsewhere. For example, we did about twice as well at predicting European ancestry traits compared to East Asian ancestry traits and about four to five times as accurately as in African ancestry populations. That's enormous. Um, I think the scale of this is just staggering. And I can't think of any other biomarker that works so differently across populations not due to anything to do with your health, but simply due to who your ancestors are. This can be your ancestors on the order of hundreds of thousands of years. So why is that impacting genetic prediction accuracy right now? Well, it's fundamentally due to who we're studying in our um, genetic studies. So I've sort of laid out what I think is gonna be necessary to facilitate our diverse population genetic studies. Really the essence of this bold prediction, how are we gonna get there? Well, I see some really big critical needs. There's some big gaps in our genetic studies that need to be filled. And that'll actually open up huge scientific opportunities. So let's start with the needs. The first is that we have genetics and statistical methods that mostly assume quite a bit of homogeneity. And that's led to a practice where we keep analyzing the largest group in our genetic studies and leaving out the more heterogeneous and ancestrally diverse groups. The second area is in data and community resources. This is an entire huge scope of um, research that I think needs to be unlocked. So we need to make better use of our existing data. We need to collate data across previous boundaries where analysis is sort of stalled. We need to develop resources. This is not just in the genetic discovery space, but this is also downstream of genetic discovery. So once we have associations, how then do we do biological perturbation when our cell lines don't mirror the ancestral diversity of the discovery cohort? We also, of course, then need to grow our genetic studies to reflect the ancestral diversity that we're hoping to serve. And then lastly, it's really critical that we grow research capacity to train the next generation of diverse researchers such that they can lead these studies in their home communities and in their home countries. Um, Jen Wojcik gave a really fantastic bold prediction seminar earlier, and I would encourage you to look back at one particular slide that I think was so fantastic, where she showed that the representation in our genetic studies doesn't mirror our funding bodies. It doesn't, or sorry, it doesn't mirror the representation in the U.S. Um, it doesn't mirror the representation in what we're hoping to serve, the sort of global diversity of participants, but really what it's reflecting is those academic researchers. It's really reflecting the background of who's doing the research. So if we can sort of flip that, flip the research model and make sure that our researchers are as diverse as those participants we hope to serve, then I think that'll have a huge impact on translation to more diverse and underrepresented populations. 
there's huge scientific missed opportunities that this will facilitate. So the first area is in identifying new biology. There's a lot of low hanging fruit out there in genetics, simply because we keep studying diverse, uh, studying Eurocentric populations. So those populations that have, uh, you know, associations with the disease, um, but that aren't varying in European ancestry populations are just waiting to be identified by studying those groups. We can also more accurately pinpoint those variants that are causal by doing these genetic studies in more diverse groups by leveraging that rich and diverse ancestral history, which impacts actually the correlation structure of the genome through linkage disequilibrium patterns. For genetic risk prediction, I hope I've made the case that we're really a long ways off of equitable progress right now, and that what we need fundamentally to improve equity in that um, space is more diverse um, and more ancestrally, uh, you know, heterogeneous populations included in those studies to sort of even out the field there. And then Dr. Wynn is going to talk a lot more about how genetic and environmental determinants of health um, are really going to be sort of an area that we need to invest in if we hope to learn equitably about human health. Okay, so I just wanted to talk a little bit more about some of the fantastic efforts that I think are underway prioritizing diversity and why there should be some hope for the future, especially in genetics. There are a lot of studies of various populations and phenotypes, both in academic and in industry settings, as well as in collaborations between the two that are prior prioritizing diversity in genomics. Um, I've listed a few logos from different efforts that are going on here. Um, on the right side of the slide, I'm showing a figure from a review from a few years ago from Emer Kenny's group summarizing uh, biobanks by different continental regions um, against percent non-European ancestry participants. And of course, most of our biobanks right now are primarily coming from European and American groups um, with a small but growing number of East Asian biobanks contributing here as well. But notably, there are entire continents that are missing here. So we don't have any biobanks that were covered um, in this sort of genetics uh, context from South America and from Africa, entire continents that are sort of missing from biobank analyses right now. So one effort that I'm really excited about is the Global Biobank Meta-Analysis Initiative, or GBMI for short. This is collating data across existing analytical boundaries. It's a major effort to bring together the power of biobanks and electronic health records to understand the genetics of understudied diseases in some ancestrally diverse groups. So in this study, or in this major initiative and project, uh, there are 14 different diseases that are underrepresented in GWAS um, and that are not the usual focus of genomics consortia, but that are already present in many different biobanks. As an example here, asthma, I think, is a really interesting uh, phenotype to study because there are very vastly differing uh, prevalences across different areas of the world, across different populations, um, and across different biobanks that are included here. Um, this is a huge effort that includes a flagship paper as well as 16 different companion papers as part of this effort, several of which were discussed at uh, the American Society of Human Genetics Conference uh, just last week. There's lots of methods papers, for example, on best practices for conducting polygenic score analysis in complex traits and uh, disease phenotypes. There's a lot of different phenotype papers, for example, the one I mentioned about asthma across different ancestry groups. And then there's a bunch of biobank uh, papers coming out as well. So GBMI, I think, is an example of work we have, or sorry, asthma is an example of a phenotype where we've really been able to dive deeper by coupling um, information from many, many different biobanks and doing a deep dive on this phenotype. So we've identified many different novel loci. So we've identified 180 um, genome-wide significant loci, 60 of which are brand new because we brought together data from 18 different biobanks. 150,000 cases plus um, are involved in this study. There's remarkable consistency in how we're estimating effects across different ancestry groups, across different biobanks. And that's pretty amazing considering the prevalence in these biobanks and across different parts of the world varies by more than an order of magnitude. So from 2% to over 20%, we're seeing massive difference in prevalence. And yet we're identifying reproducible genetic associations across all of these uh, biobanks. We're improving polygenic prediction accuracy by putting together the largest study of asthma to date, but also the most diverse study of asthma to date. 
Um, that's a little disappointing considering we're still quite Eurocentric in this study because biobanks are simply so Eurocentric right now. Um, I should mention, this is an effort that I'm really excited about that's being led uh, by some folks uh, in my group, Kristen Suo and uh, Ying Wang are very talented grad students and postdocs. Um, there's another major push that I'm so excited by, which is the populations underrepresented in mental illness association studies, which we're calling the PUMAS project. This is an NIMH funded study that's really an umbrella project that encapsulates studies that are taking place in Eastern, Southern, and Western Africa, as well as several parts of the Americas. This includes colleagues at the Harvard School of Public Health, uh, SUNY Downstate, more recently Rutgers and UCLA um, in the US, as well as investigators in each of these um, countries and at each of the sites that are enrolling participants. This is a massive study that's recruiting and phenotyping 180,000 participants in Latin America and Africa and is harmonizing all of these phenotypes across all of these sites. So clearly this is a huge endeavor. As part of this study, we're sequencing to 4x depth 120,000 genomes, um, including 40,000 schizophrenia cases, 40,000 bipolar cases, and 40,000 population match controls. We're running GWAS, developing browsers, and um, sort of rectifying, I think, some of the harms done by Safari research, by, which actually make the work a lot harder and less beneficial to all by recognizing local leaders and having local leaders really, really deeply integrated um, and leading many of these studies. Um, I think there's all sorts of fantastic science to come from here. So I introduced this sort of as a way to introduce how I see um, sustainable, diverse genomic studies happening in the future. There's many different pieces of this and it's non-linear and there's a lot of feedback loops between all of these different components. But we've, uh, together with several colleagues, including Shagun Fatumo, who um, led this effort, have been thinking about the different pillars that are gonna make our genomic studies more sustainable. One of these is stakeholder will. So which re what research do the communities that participate actually want to be conducted? In terms of infrastructure, low and middle income countries have tremendous power to conduct researchers. Um, and we can lend support by providing some computational pipelines, pointing them to resources that already exist, um, sharing a lot of the knowledge that's been ingrained in a lot of GWAS consortia for decades, um, and is making biorepositories accessible and helping uh, set those up from knowledge, again, gained from decades of genomics uh, research. Strategic funding is a really critical component of this. So for example, there've been calls from NIH prioritizing diversity. We also need to be open, I think, to public and private pharma partnerships. Realistically, this is how UK Biobank was even feasible. I talked a little bit about capacity building, but I just want to mention this is not one-off classes. Mentorship is a long-term commitment. Um, and capacity building programs, from my experience, involve multi-year training programs with in-person visits, things like on-site online weekly classrooms, on-site trainings, and mentored research projects. And then global consortia contribute enormously to our overall knowledge. Um, those underrepresented populations contributing to this also gain global recognition for involvement in these. Okay, and then just to end, our genetic studies are actually not enough if what we're hoping to do is address health disparities. They're incredibly powerful and things I love about genetics is that it's incredibly reproducible. It's systematically measurable. That's great. Our environmental studies, um, unfortunately, don't have things like a GWAS array to reproducibly, consistently, and unbiasedly measure external impacts on disease risk. Um, we're using the UK Biobank as a starting point to try to systematically model the environment. So we're pulling as a starting point thousands of phenotypes from electronic health records and providing um, information from an unprecedented ep epidemiological cohort to learn the, uh, the latent structure of many environmental phenotypes together. Um, we have over 20,000 participants from primarily non-European ancestry uh, populations that also identify differently from white British Europeans. So we're planning on using factor analysis to model polygenic scores together with things like environmental pollution, for example, in the case of asthma. Um, this diagram just illustrates how we're planning on pulling together that correlated structure from the environment together with genetics. 
Okay, so uh, we've been asked to go out on a little bit of a limb um, and speak to how bold the ambition was uh, and to go bolder if we will. Um, I don't wanna predict any bolder because I think this was already quite a bold prediction as it is, but my bold ambition would be that genetic epidemiology serves as a lens. Um, this is a gateway for broader epidemiological studies. It will facilitate systematic and reproducible discoveries of genetic and environmental contributions to disease and health disparities. So I'll stop there, there and thank you so much. I, thank you, Dr. Martin. I, I wanna thank you for that uh, wonderful talk. Um, I also wanna thank Chris and, and, and Vince for, um, and the NHGIR for giving me the opportunity to spend a little time with you. My talk's gonna be a little bit different and it's not in contrast, it's really an and conversation of picking up uh, where the last conversation was. Um, so I'm going to just share my slides with you real quick. And I'm going to start off by really trying to make the case that we are at the very beginning of something really big. I actually think that as I think about the impact of genomes, uh, you know, that there is an opportunity for real talk. So I took this uh, uh, talk a little bit different of individuals and ancestral diverse backgrounds would benefit from equitable, uh, equitably from advances in human genomics. And I broke that down into an emphasis on the equity and the genetics focus. Now I have to share with you that one of the most proudest times I had in my life was uh, being picked as one of the four initial groups for the all of us study uh, with, and being one of the PIs on the Illinois Precision Medicine Consortium. So I really believe in the power of science and the power of genetics. I'm also reminded, and this is going back and by, you know, I'm an RNA binding guy, but I'm no geneticist. But I do remember uh, from high school and from college that the way we got genetic variation, at least we used to talk about it in other terms, is that there would be isolation and geographic distance that would relate in some impact on the DNA that would result in some genetic variations. I submit to you that those geographic distances and isolation in some ways I'd like to come back to as a theme because those things are now created with structures, structures that we created that actually still have impact on one's DNA. In fact, uh, the shorthand that I'll be using is looking at uh, one's impact of the ZNA, that is the zip code neighborhood of association on one's DNA and biological outcomes. It's clear to me that I think that we all need to get away from race. Race certainly is a, um, has never been a great biological predictor and, and clearly a social construct. But I think at the underlying root of this talk, and what I just got from Dr. Martin and what I get from the potential of the NHGIR when it was originally formed are values. And when we look and we figure out that the vast majority of our genetic studies are predominantly in Caucasians and with very little uh, in other diverse populations, we have to talk about our values. The old thing from Donald Berwick is when values are strong, rules are unnecessary. When values are weak, rules are insufficient, is in play. And let me just, by the way, and people who know me know that I'm always starting off with this because as we talk about health disparities, I got it with COVID and with all the social unrest we had, it's really brought this to the forefront and many people are actually embracing this. But let us not forget that these issues around disparities, not only in the US, by the way, we're really well written about by one of the best social scientists, I think, of his time and still remains a great social scientist of all time, W.E.B. Du Bois, who wrote the Philadelphia Papers in 1899 that described differences in our populations, in this case, in the United States, uh, African-Americans and, and whites. But interestingly enough, W.E.B. Du, Bo e. du Bois actually wrote about it much broader in a sort of pan-Africanism, if you will, look. So this is not just unique. Uh, to only the United States. We certainly have talked about being bold and I'm reminded of the bold act of 1971 where we had a war on cancer and we understood that by understanding the DNA and understanding the basic mechanisms of cancer that by from 1971 to 1981, we would have cured cancer because we'd have understood it all. Clearly that was fairly naive. 
Uh, this was under the National Cancer Act that was led by both Ted Kennedy and President Nixon. But what it did show us is that by gaining an understanding of the biology, even though back then it was bare skin and sharp knives, that by gaining an understanding of the biology, it was clear that in the fight against disease that we certainly know that the understanding of that is certainly necessary to make progress, but unfortunately not sufficient in and of itself to eradicate. This is where we have a bold opportunity. Again, I really love being part of the Precision Medicine Initiative that became the All of Us program because I believe in the uh, getting more representation of genetic image and, and DNA information from, from, from all populations. And certainly as a result of things that we've done, we've certainly made progress in reducing disparities between black whites and other things, but they still exist. The interesting thing about scientific progress and this is no indictment of anyone because I'm equally as guilty, is that typically when we have scientific progress, it comes at a cost. We typically see, and this is by Otis Brawley, and, and I agree that when you have improvements in, for example, in screening and, uh, and other applications of, uh, of, of, of technology, it usually benefits one group and not the other. In fact, we've seen historically that breast and colorectal cancers actually became worse after we introduced our new amazing technologies. I worry about that because as we're now moving into the era of precision medicine, immunotherapy, and being able to understand the genome much better, it is even more incumbent upon us to figure out how we can become more inclusive. This is just an example of the SEER data. Uh, bottom line is, if you look in the early days, if you look in the 50s and 60s, it's not much difference between black and white, you know, uh, overall cancer deaths. But with the advent of mammographies and all the rest of these other things, you can all of a sudden see some differences. I think it's important because I think that in some ways we can be somewhat out of touch about what it is that we're doing and what we're thinking. This is just an example of just sort of saying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, from the NCC and an ACS, they looked at a bunch of uh, oncologists, just practicing oncologists and said, not so much are you doing a good job, but how's everybody else doing? And in general, they would say, I may be doing a good job, but everybody else is not doing so well when it comes to these health disparities outcomes. So when it comes to the genetics and the history, it's clear that, and uh, I, I thought it was a wonderful opening slide about how people travel. Well, certainly I believe that the genetics and ancestry, that there is something to be said for, you know, people moving in this case from Africa to different parts of the Caribbean and South Africa, and et cetera, et cetera. I'm reminded that this is wonderful work that actually led to findings like, for example, in African-American women uh, who came predominantly with a ancestry from Eastern Africa, as opposed to Western Africa, that they would have better outcomes from triple negative breast cancer. I'm also reminded by some new studies that are actually coming out that are at least hinting at that if you're an African-American male, uh, that if you're an African from the Northwest portions of Africa and you have prostate cancer, that you have a worse outcome than Africans from the central part of Africa or the south, Southern part of Africa. So when I look at this, what I'm, I'm actually excited about what the NHGIR has the possibility of doing is expanding our conversations between the typical or what we've had for the last 57 or since 1899 about just black, white. Ancestry clearly plays a role. And I think that there is a wonderful opportunity of teasing that out if we're thoughtful and careful about what that says. However, I still submit that independent of that, whether you're from East Africa or whether you're from West Africa ancestry and you have triple negative breast cancer, I can't be convinced that the place in space still has active pressure in one way or another on that DNA. And as a result, this impact of ZNA on ancestry and ZNA on genetics I think comes back to play a significant role, which is why I am no longer convinced that just having one approach is going to tell us everything. I think just like in 1971 by James Watson and others by believing, well, if we just understood what happened at the DNA level, we'd be able to cure cancer is a good start, but not enough. So what happened?
happens when we, and this is a great study by Campbell and, and Matt Myers and these guys, what happens when we look at black-white differences? For example, we're looking at biomarkers, in this case, lung cancer, and we don't see any differences in driver mutations. What does that mean? Well, for me, this is an example of a wonderful study that then allows us to go under the hood and maybe look at things of splice variants or other issues that may be at play from the mechanistic and genetic side, but it also allows us to think about what are the things that are happening in the sphere of the ZNA, right? As we know, disproportionately African-Americans, however, uh, particularly men, die substantially more from lung cancer than their white counterparts. But clearly when you're looking at these biomarkers and these types of driving mutations, there's no difference. I actually think that this is a wonderful opportunity to actually not just put our blinders on and just say, well, if it's not down this path, well, then it's, I think it's a great opportunity to do the work like that's been done at Duke, you know, with Dr. Paternal and others about different aspects of the genetics and what's happening as a result of that sphere of the ZNA. We always talk about the genome impacting the cell well, in the old SAT, you know, there used to be this, you know, for you guys who were back in the day, it used to be this comparative thing. You would say the genome impacts cells as, in this case, community, place, and space impacts the individual. I actually think that as we're starting to really think about the genome, I think it's time, even though it adds a level of complexity, to be able to understand how big data, not now, but aspirationally, how we'll be able to unpack the interplay between that DNA and DNA better as we move ahead. We as academic cancer centers, and we're guilty, really guilty of this, have been very focused on the fundamental research and downstream factors without having any clue as to how these upstream pressures, how these upstream determinants are impacting, again, our DNA. I actually think it's high time that as we think about the food insecurity, as we think about housing issues, as we think about transportation issues, as we think about many of these other things, these social determinants of health that we actually talk about, that we have to understand that first, that the social determinants of health, while it's really cool academic interest, just didn't happen. The truth of the matter is they've been part of a overlying structure. So let's go back. I am really love genetics because ultimately an ancestor, that means you're trying to see what you have here now, but also how do you track it back? Well, let's understand that Dr. Hoyt, who was the uh, chief of, um, at the time, uh, back in 19, I think the early 1930s, was put in charge of the National Housing Act uh, and came up as part of his you know, uh, you know, what he did is his thesis to say, well, you know, we should probably segregate people on housing based on their ability to function at the highest level. And so obviously he had a scale. And if you were Caucasian, you were actually considered genetically, this is crazy, but I know, back from the National Housing Act, genetically to be, have more of the characteristics and all the rest of that to be able to make a payment. I mean, crazy. And he went down the list, right? Then he got to African-Americans, then he got down to people who were of Jewish descent, et cetera. This whole concept of redlining just wasn't simple about paying mortgages. This paying mortgages was again, tied into this whole issue of race. This structure allowed for the segregation of populations, the isolation, if you will, of various populations. Huh? And so in this case, you'd see the yellow and the red. These were the places where, in this case, Virginia 1935, where African-Americans were allowed to live, but the blue and the green were areas in which folks on the higher end of that scale, Caucasians, et cetera, were able to live, segregation. But despite segregation, right, these isolation, if you will, this structural isolation, you had many communities that were actually incredibly robust. They had their own banks, they had their own stores, so it's not so much the isolation, but the second wave of federal issues that decimated many of these communities. Again, a geography sort of issue of the urban renewal program that ran through the 1950s and 60s and maybe even to the early 70s in which 
we build light roads through black bedrooms. In some cases completely decimated these communities. Interesting enough, some of the most communities that were actually the, the, the best targeted were some of the African-American communities in this case that were actually doing the most and had the most stability because they were targeted as being slums. Why is this important? As we talk about isolation, as we talk about geography, we have to talk about structure. And as we're thinking about these structures created by us, clearly, but these structures, that zip code and neighborhood of association has had an impact, right, on certain populations, not just beyond access, right, to quality care, to things like, for example, having, you know, uh, businesses and, uh, and, um, and, 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 and chemical industries that were actually more toxic in the areas that they were put. Work done by Christopher Tessiman and these guys uh, back at University of Illinois, which I really love his work, actually even just, you know, looked, he looked at just a simple matter, particulate matter 2.5. And he saw that particulate matter 2.5 was disproportionately and systemically affecting people of color in the United States. And as most of us know, this particular matter 2.5 is associated with increased cancer. Again, it's not to actually get away from genomics, it's actually to be inclusive of the sphere of zip code and neighborhood and those things that are happening, those active pressures are also impacting our genetics and our DNA. I'm gonna end with this and saying that I actually think we're at an inflection point in not only in society, but in science, where with just a little bit of effort, and it's more than just getting African-Americans or getting Latinos or getting more people from Central Africa or, or from Latin America onto these studies. It's in addition to that. It's the focus, it's the ultimate goal at the end, the boldness of that this tool of science will literally be able to be equitably distributed and benefit all. I'll end with this. On the eve of the Apollo 11 march, uh, 11 moon landing, Ralph Abernathy, one of our giants of the civil rights era, who walked arm in arm with Martin Luther King, actually had a protest and said, listen, and ultimately so much so made so much noise that Deputy Payne, who represented NASA at that time, came out to just say, listen, I'll just meet with you. Ralph Abernathy explained to him, listen, I love the fact that America, I got it. We're, I know communists, Russia, et cetera, et cetera. I got it. We're leading the, the world. We're showing our prowess. We're showing our technological you know, gifts. We're doing it. We are, and I actually am supporting that. But why can't we also focus some of that attention on some of our communities, particularly our more at-risk communities? And without missing a beat, Deputy Payne said, because it's easier to put a man on the moon than Reverend Abernathy it is to address those issues. I submit to you that today we stand at an inflection point in which I believe that if any of these women were to develop cancer, independent of where they are, that place and space matters. That the pressures, just like we used to talk about in early, by early genetics of isolation, distance and the pressure on the DNA cause. When we're thinking about health outcomes and we're thinking about using this tool for good, I think we are going to have to think about that DNA in place in space and its impact on the DNA. I actually predict boldly that we will be more equitable because we're going to be more deliberate about the accessibilities of these wonderful tools. I actually also think that the bold prediction is that we will be more successful because I think that if COVID and the recent events have taught us anything, it's that a dose of humility goes a long way in science of understanding that while we understand some, the humility understand that these other problems, as Dr. Uh, as Thomas Paine, Deputy Payne would say, putting a man is easier to put a man on the moon than these other issues. Well. We do things, I think once we had a president says, we do things not because it is easy, but because it is hard. I believe that there's wonderful science and the tools that we actually have right now will allow us and the NHGIR to make a significant difference. And with that, I will stop and uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity.
uh, to present. Thank you so much to both of you, Robert and Alicia. I wish we were in person so that I could hear a whole auditorium full of people clapping uh, at, at the end of your talk. So what I'm going to do first is I am taking the moderator's privilege and I have a few questions for y'all. I'd love to hear you talk to each other about a couple of things. So you both talked quite a bit about ideas that we all could do as a group. Um, and, and you know we specifically listed in our strategic vision that we wanted to maximize the usability of genomics for all members of the public, et cetera. But I want to step back for a second. And I know we have a lot of trainees who uh, watch this and, and younger PIs. And we also maybe have some PIs who are thinking about writing new grants, et cetera. So if you were in their shoes, what is one or the first or maybe the most important thing as a researcher that I could do to design my next study with human genomic data to help achieve this full prediction? Mark, I'll let you start. Sure, happy to get started. Um, I think a lot of our genetic studies in the past are not indicative of our genetic studies in the future in many ways. The ways that they've been designed have changed and the ways that we engage with our science has also changed. And that's often for the better. Um, in that way, I think it's really important to start with some of the key principles for designing genetic studies. Dr. Wynn and I had some, I think, really fantastic conversations before this about some of the principles for designing equitable studies in different contexts and context spanning low and middle income countries um, in context span, <laughs> sorry about the background noise, um, in context uh, spanning different socioeconomic uh, groups, different groups uh, from various levels of privilege. And I think the recognition that resources vary across these settings is the very first um, principle that you need to keep in mind. And in trying to balance those resources, one of the, I think, really key critical components is trust. So from this angle, I think it's really important that we have an open dialogue with the community. I think community advisory boards are becoming much more prevalent and that's fantastic for our genetic studies. So how we're designing our genetic studies should be in, um, you know, influenced by what research and what studies are top priorities from those underrepresented groups. Um, and then that science needs to flow back to the community in some way. We need to be communicating our science. We need to be returning our science to the community. Um, we need to be ensuring that researchers from those communities benefit uh, and that the participants in some ways can benefit um, whether that's a short-term or a long-term benefit, I think is really key and critical. Um, some ways that we can do that are designing capacity building programs that run hand in hand with our scientific endeavors. Um, that's an area where it's much harder to get funding. So I would um, sort of like to impress upon uh, NIH that these calls, I think, for capacity building are really, really critical um, and actually make the science better and more equitable in the long-term and more sustainable. So I would start, yeah. <laughs> so as a starting point, I guess, you know, engaging with the communities is really critical before setting out on these endeavors. Um, I would I start there. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I, I also would add that there are some myths that we have to get rid of. Uh, one of the myths is, you know, that, that uh, many of these populations won't sign up. That's actually not true. What you'll find out, like any clinical trial and research, the vast majority of people just simply aren't asked because we assume they don't want to actually participate. Number two, what I've learned is that there's only one team, one fight. You have to develop a team. By, by and large, wanting to, in, wanting to gather trust actually also depends on the acts of our trustworthiness. For example, I rarely, if someone to now say to me, Rob, Dr. Wynn, I want to go and I want to design, the very first question I have is, well, who on your team is from the community? And, and not just, do you have someone that you can take to the community? I specifically said, who from your team is from the communities that you're trying to study? That is part of the trust building. So not to belabor the point, but I think we actually more than 20 years ago, if someone were to come to us, I think there are experts around at the NIH and uh, around the country now in academics who actually have a much better understanding about not just the discovery sciences, but the implementation of these sciences. And I think that the wonderful part about if a young person were to come to me now trying to design one, I'd have experts to send them to that says, hey, if you're going to set this trial up and you want to get the various populations, you might want to talk to X, Y, and Z or look at these papers. I actually, this is why I 
and more than cautiously optimistic that we're making progress. Yeah, that's so important. And I'm seeing that as well in the field that I spend more time in, which is the genetics of autism spectrum disorder. A lot of trying to have people from the community involved in studies, et cetera. That's exactly, y'all are speaking my language here. You also spoke my language a little bit about talking about science communication, which is something that I am really passionate about, effective science communication. And some of the areas that we talked about today are prone to misinterpretation and even misinformation sometimes. So I'm curious, what do you feel is your responsibility as a scientist to communicate your work? I, I start off with actually now um, the talks I used to do 10 years ago are very different than the talks I do today. Uh, and in fact, I used to just have talks that were so heavy with data. And then I recognized that people can hide behind. There was so much data that they, they could just say, well, that's the data. I, I want to actually get back to real talk. Much of what we're not doing as we talk about the design of these studies has nothing to do with the data other than the reflection that it shows that we have been much more because reflective of the people doing the research than the people asking the questions about all of the other communities. That's not a data issue. That data is there. The question is, now that we have the data, what are we going to do? For me, I think the other thing I've become very clear about is that it's not so much that the community is slow. We're slow too. In fact, I was at a, I was once at a town hall in Chicago, and one of my scientists stepped up there and uh, said, "Well, you know, I know you people are all, you know, scientifically illiterate." And this, I swear to God, this eighty-five-year-old woman st stood up and said the best words that still resonate resonate with me today. She said, "Well, I don't know if we scientifically illiterate, but you illiterate too." And what she meant by that is you had no understanding of these communities and yet you were right. And so I think that grace and humility, and I really mean that, that us having a little ounce of grace, which is hard for us to do sometimes, and just a little dose of humility will allow us to think differently about engaging our communities. And yes, it's driven by data, but data alone, just like trying to understand DNA alone, get you somewhere, but doesn't get you, is necessary, but not always sufficient. So I think that I'm hoping that as scientists, we can actually evolve and have different types of discussion so that we can kind of have more of an impact. Yeah, I totally agree with all of that and would just add from my experience that it's not hard to take small steps in science communication. For our studies, for example, it's typical to just publish a paper and to move on, but that's not the end of it, right? Like it shouldn't be the end of it. This is not a dialogue with society. This is something that's like jargony and kind of totally misses societal conversations. So how do we then move forward with societal conversations? Well, there's like pretty easy steps we can take that I think we're seeing sort of like a transformation a little bit, at least in some of the large scale genomic studies that I'm seeing. So for example, I've seen where people have tried to anticipate some frequently asked questions that might arise from their work um, and then have designed sort of these pages of frequently asked questions that are targeting maybe a couple of different levels. Maybe they're targeting a lay audience. Maybe they're targeting a slightly scientifically inclined audience that's not in their field and is just writing answers at both of those levels and is getting feedback from different people. So it's not hard to share your science when it's written at that level. If you're asking for people to review a manuscript that's very jargon heavy, no one's going to read that. If you're asking for feedback on some pretty simple, frequently asked questions, and you're asking that of other um, people in your field or of different social scientists or people from the community, people will read that. And that's probably going to be accessed a whole lot more than your paper. So really, I think there's also like some reward to that. It's nice to have your science communicated. There's a give and a take. You can actually open a dialogue and it'll frankly improve your science in the long run. So I see so many benefits um, from opening these lines of communication. I agree. I, I was thinking of a recent uh, something that I had heard about Dr. Uh, Landers, Eric Landers, who's in the office right now, the advisor of the president sort of said, he's certain that we're going to be making continual advances and in innovations and in technology. But what he's most worried about is that we'll lose public trust. And as we sort of see through this COVID period, you can have a miracle of science, but that miracle of science doesn't mean that the people will let them impact all the people without trust, right? So I started thinking to myself that there's two things that we frequently miss. One is that there's a bilingualism to our science conversations. And two, <laughs> which is the, the thing that I have now adopted, 
uh, and uh, moving my cancer center now from a bench to bedside to more of a people to buy pet that you have to understand the communities and the people and what we're addressing. And hopefully that information helps then help you refine even your basic science question. So I'm pushing that, but I push that in the backdrop of something that I remember all the way from Notre Dame, which I know if Dr. Miles is actually even out there, I know he's an Ohio State kind of guy, but a Notre Dame guy, I had to bring it up. But something I learned in Notre Dame was from WB Yates who said, certainly think like a wise man, but communicate in the language of the people. There is nothing wrong about being very deep in our thinking and very technical in our thinking. WBA said it, but I think when we communicate, we need to communicate in the language of the people. Otherwise, we may wind up finding ourselves with an even wider chasm of being very smart people who ultimately find out that the vast majority of people just don't give a hoot. And ultimately, we then start finding out, well, why don't they care? They will never care until they know, right? People don't know. People do not care how much you know until they know that you care. The field of science, as much as it hurts, I think we are going to have to get back into a mindset of the early days of showing people that we really care. We're doing this because we want to actually make an impact and benefit their lives. That's why the equitability and the genetics component, I am absolutely wrapped and embraced on that we can do this. Yeah, I, and I really like that flipping the paradigm from bench to bedside to people to buy pet, turning that around and, and thinking about changing the priority of the relationship between those. I really like that. And you have obviously segue me into my next question perfectly. You guys are amazing, which is, we talked a lot. We talked about equitable benefits, benefits in general. So I, one thing that we haven't talked about as specifically is I want to encourage y'all to go out on a limb, be bold, speculate, all that. What area of medicine do you expect to see the most advances or tangible benefits? Cause that is in the bold prediction between now and 2030, specifically from genomics. Uh, we have different areas, but maybe they're sort of the same. In I work in the like sort of complex disease space, and the areas that I'm most excited about because they're already pushing the envelope the most is in um, things like breast cancer, prostate cancer, and cardiovascular disease. Those are the areas where I see clinicians already sort of trying to implement genetics alongside other well-known risk factors. We already have models that people are running clinical trials on right now that companies are already marketing genetics alongside these other risk factors. Um, it's already accessible and available via software to physicians, hundreds, maybe thousands of physicians. Um, there's already benchmarks for and sort of policy guidance for how NHS health checks in the UK might incorporate genetics alongside these other risk factors at just routine visits. So those are areas that I'm really excited about and I'm interested in. And I think uh, we, absolutely have to address this equity issue as fast as possible to ensure that like as fast as these areas of policy are being changed we don't exacerbate health health disparities just you know as these are being rolled out even more and i'm biased so we're keeping it short it's going to be in cancer <laughs> I, I would never have predicted you'd say that. <laughs> All right, be a little more specific. Go out on a limb. What do you What do you see tangibly benefiting by 2030? What would you like to see? I actually think that as we're starting to get, and I mentioned earlier, of, of understanding how the role of ancestry actually plays a different role as opposed to just this broader context of Black. For example, I think that um, understanding that if you're from Northwest Africa, as opposed to central versus southern Africa, that you have worse outcomes. Once we get beyond the hood of the accessibility and all the rest of that issue, it turns out that there may be something, right, to the ancestral genetics that we can then use as biomarkers. I actually think that right now we seem, quote, like we're a far, we're far away from that, but I don't think we're nearly as far as we think. Yeah. I actually think that with the big data, the more we get our hands around that, the more we get used to it, the more we start thinking about the poly risk scores and how to modify that and how to make it even more sophisticated because we're ultimately over the next, I think, 20 to 30 years between now and in the next 20, 30 years, getting more people involved, getting more people on trials, learning how to do that better, getting more people to studies. I think the power of that will actually drive our ability to really start doing what I started off doing in the All of Us program, which is person-based medicine. That I'm looking not only at your genome, 
but the impact of the ZNA and learning those things on that DNA in the genetics, right? And I think that the interplay between those and our more sophistication of aspirationally driving that is where we're really going to get the benefits of person-based medicine or precision medicine. That's what I'm looking forward to. Yeah. Just following up on that, Dr. Wynn and I had, I think, a really phenomenal conversation before this in the planning as well about the fact that with our genetics, we're measuring things about our ancestry, but that really leaves us very short on what we're measuring about how you live your life and about all of the factors that contribute to your disease risk. And a lot of our clinical models do, you know, race adjustment or self-identity adjustment. And like, where is that getting us? And why are we there? You know, obviously we need to be diving deeper into the factors that are actually directly impacting these things. Like, do we have food security in different populations? What is the, you know, various groups access to fresh food and fresh vegetables and that sort of thing. If we're actually trying to get at those, um, factors that are directly impacting health through proxy variables related to how we identify, maybe we should just measure those (laughs) instead of trying to incorporate things like race and ethnicity into these models as sort of broad catch-alls that really miss individual experience. What I love about this conversation is elevating the research of, we call it health disparities and would be hashtag that we're looking at. I'm looking at any disparities. For example, even in Norway, I I was given a talk there in, in, uh, in, in Oslo and I found out that there was a 10 year difference between life expectancy and Oslo. And they were like, well, 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 we're one of the most homogeneous. And it turns out that it was related to other, fa- other factors like educational attainment. And then all of a sudden we were able to say, oh, disparity. So you just, all that gives you is an, a, a way to look under the hood to be more clear about the questions we're asking. So if someone told me, why am I super happy? I think that we're seeing right before our eyes, the growing up, if you will, or even the more aspirational pushing of precision medicine. That's what I'm excited about. Right. And it's going to be more complicated. And I understand that. And even scientists, we are reductionists. So by definition, we hate you know, complications, but it's interesting that on the one level, we talk about the wonders of systems of biology, but then when it gets really complicated, we get just like deputy Payne. Well, it's easy to put somebody on the moon because that's really hard. Yeah. Right? We don't and so I think as scientists, we, I, you know, I am pushing us to say, come on, man, come yeah. on, folk. Embrace the complexity. <laughs> Embrace right. the exactly. complexity and let's go. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Yeah. All right. I could talk to y'all all day, but I know that people who are watching this have a number of questions. So I have asked my colleague Vince Bonham, who's an expert in this area to join us. I know he has questions of his own too. So Vince, take it away. So thank you. This has just been a great afternoon. I want to thank both Dr. Martin and Dr. Wynn for such excellent uh, talks and this conversation this afternoon. Um, So I'm going to jump right in with some questions of my own, as well as to jump into the questions that are in the Q&A. So my first question is for Dr. Martin. Um, So figure three in your Nature Genetics paper on uh, the issue of polygenetic risk scores and health disparities is now being used all over in talks and uh, across the country and across the world. And, And my question is, is the accuracy of polygenetic risk scores getting better for some non-European populations? Yeah, that's a great question. So in that figure, we looked at quantitative traits, things like height, BMI, and then a variety of blood panel traits. Um, I would say things are getting better and it really depends on which phenotype and how many cohorts are being used to study those different populations. So we're seeing in uh, schizophrenia, for example, that when we have sample sizes from East Asians that are a third the sample size of what we're seeing in the European ancestry populations, we're already making up a huge gap and we're doing a better job at predicting in that ancestry match group with that much smaller sample size. And that's when we're just looking at these cohorts independently, but the best results are coming when we actually aggregate all of the data. So we're making up lost ground really fast when we just include um, data from those underrepresented populations. Depends on the phenotype. Um, Schizophrenia is a really complicated one though. And the fact that we're making progress there gives me hope for other phenotypes for sure. Great, great. So uh, Alicia, in your slide of facilitating diverse population genetic studies toward health equity, um, you identified three different areas uh, with regards to needs that were 
to, to move forward. One is methods that you talked about. Um, second was data. And the third was research capacity. And my question to you, um, what you think is the most challenging uh, to address? That's a great question. I think um, methods is not the most challenging. I would say we'll develop the statistical methods. We always develop the methods when the data are there for the problems. The data are not there for the problems. So the data are clearly one of the biggest issues. Um, as to whether data or research capacity is the bigger issue, I can't answer that. Those are those go hand in hand. Those are equally important, and will like the research capacity will drive the data generation. So there's just this feedback loop between those two that I think will help empower both. Okay, great. So there's a follow up question though. What would you have NIH and NHGRI do to address those issues? <laughs> That's a great question. I think um, one of the one of, from my personal experience, one of the most rewarding aspects of being involved in genetics at this particular time has been in setting up, helping set up and design and work with colleagues um, across low and middle income countries and designing research studies that go hand in hand with research capacity building efforts. That's been so rewarding for such a number of reasons. One is that the science has moved forward at just an unbelievable pace. Um, we've enrolled over, uh, over 30,000 participants and are targeting 40,000 participants by the end of the year across Eastern and Southern Africa for this NeuroGAP study that I didn't have time to mention. But that's incredible. 40,000 participants are involved in this study across Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, and South Africa, places that don't have a whole lot of experience setting up massive international um, genomics studies. And that's happened over the course of the past like five years. Like that's amazing. Um, progress has been incredibly fast, but that's not what's been most exciting um, about this whole endeavor. The thing that I think has been most exciting about this endeavor is actually the trainees progress. Um, working hand in hand with the junior researchers involved there has just shown how much aspiration they have and how much ability they have and the hunger and thirst, like how much it's there. And I am just dead convinced that some of these folks are going to be leading all of the next generation of research studies from the continent. It's phenomenal. So I think to support something like that, um, and I just going to have to go out on a little bit of a limb. These designs and these setups happened where there's not a lot of precedent for this sort of thing. So as reviewers, we're often evaluating grant applications. We're often looking at publication records in this space, and we're often looking at what track record do you have in, set in doing large-scale genomic studies. Well, that's sort of a catch-22. You can't have the experience and set something up in a new place, right? So um, what I've seen is that there's been a lot of philanthropic investment in this space to empower that and make it possible. Tens of millions of dollars to get started. And that's been followed with um, investments from NIH. Uh, if we want to actually do this at scale, those tens of millions of dollars of philanthropic funding, let's see how we can use that um, from NIH dollars to actually set this up and repeat this model in different parts of the world. Great, great, thank can you. I, can I add something to that? Yeah, though? please, Dr. Wynn. I would say that in addition to globally, we, you know, we're global and local. I think that we have in the States built infrastructures that we only partially use. Example of that, we could be doing more genetic studies and actually enrolling maybe more people if we actually looked at the FQHC and the community health centers that we put in the 60s. Mm -hmm. We can actually, I mean, sometimes I think of our community health centers are like those uh, old cars in Havana, 1950s. I mean, it hasn't changed. Maybe we should start thinking, you know, with HHS and other things like that. How could we reinvigorate getting, again, not having people come to us, but us going to there, us going to them in the community? Again, a people pipette. pet. The second thing is we do have minority serving institutions all over the country that when we talk about capacity, how could we, I'm challenging all cancer centers in the United States as we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of how can we reimagine ourselves? I'm also challenging us about how can we re-envision and reimagine how our resources could be used to build capacity. And I know that sounds bold and for many, they were like, you know, it sounds so bold. They're like, oh, we can't do it. But again, I'm like the I'm more of a Thomas Paine. I'm like, if you can put a man on the moon, we can do these other things as well. We just have to want to do them and have resources and focus and commitment. Excellent. So Dr. Wynn, I want to follow up uh, on the conversation about cancer treatment. Uh, and, and my question for you here is, 
lessons learned from precision oncology. What, what can we learn from all of the important work that's been done with genomics and cancer treatment um, that can be helpful for other disease conditions in addressing yeah, this a, issue? A great question. So lesson learned for me is that um, the power of using uh, genetics and using biomarkers to actually help really cure things that 20 years ago, I would have given up on, particularly so for example, in lung cancer or in breast cancer, advanced breast cancer. Lesson learned that we still have a lesson in that because we're not always asking those very same people, you know, who are at risk communities, hey, let's get you genetically screened and tested, right? Let's see if there are markers. So a lesson for me in oncology is the power of the science. An evolving and continuing lesson is how we can get better about bringing our communities closer to that science. So A, we're not assuming that they're gonna say no when we've never asked, and B, we can get them to yes because there's a much better understanding that if you have an alpha mutation, in fact, I just had a young woman that's going to give a talk about how her life was saved because they, you know, someone talked to her into saying, hey, get the genetically test. She did and ultimately turned around two weeks later and had an auntie who ultimately also got genetically tested, by the way, and found that there was a marker. And they're both telling the story about how important that is for all of us. So lesson for me in oncology is we've made amazing progress and there's even more to go. But there's also that less sexy part of figuring out how we can educate ourselves and others about the power of the science. Um, and I'm a believer. I mean, seeing someone with an EGFR mutation and being able to target it. And as the, you know, as the paper from Myerson and these guys sort of said, in that case, it wasn't a black white difference. The, the outcome though, if you think about it, blacks will do less well because they're not being tested for the EGFR mutation right. or the driver mutation. So, Part of this is science, and part of this is my grandmother, who's going to be 95 this year, so I said, she goes, you know, she used to always tell me, listen, when you go to school, she goes, don't get too smart that you get dumb all of a sudden. Don't recognize that common sense is common, right? We also are going to have to drive policies that ultimately will allow us to actually have more people having opportunities to sort of actually having exposure to these wonderful uh, tools as well. That's what I've been learning. Great. So I'm going to run through um, a number of the questions and um, ask for your response. So let me just start with Dr. Martin. So uh, the, the comment is bravo. Dr. Martin, for everything that you are doing to help move the needle in this space, what do you think is the, the next first step? Do you feel like we need additional GWAS uh, and more specific disease and diverse types and ancestrally diverse cohorts? Or do you feel that there is more immediate work to be done in combining existing GWAS data sets? Yeah, I think if we're hoping to make progress towards this bold ambition, the answer has to be yes and. We have to do both. So we have a project called the Pan-UK Biobank Project that's aggregating the tens of thousands of individuals whose like ancestry is primarily of non-European descent. Um, but we're also setting up these cohorts uh, and designing more ancestrally diverse cohorts in different parts of the world uh, that are going to meet this goal, I think. We need to do both if we have any shot of meeting equity in genomics and advancing equity in genomics. So um, unfortunately, I can't answer the question this way or that way. It just has to be both. That's fundamentally the case. All right, great. So the next question is for both of you. Um, how can we encourage the use of social determinants of health variables in genomic studies? Multiple talks have stressed the, their importance. There seems to be a hesitancy or lack of knowledge regarding the measurable at an individual or aggregate level and how to integrate social determinants of health variables into existing or new approaches. Is there a particular condition that is ripe for this integration? I, I think I'd, I'd start off by sort of saying that we are just not even scratching the surface of social determinants. I actually think that that is a field just like poly risk scores are just you know getting better um, and need to get better. I think that the metrics of what we're looking at for social determinants of health and the impact of those metrics and the impact of which social determinants of health matter, we're still at the beginning stages. I love that though. That is not a deterrent from me. Um, to be quite honest with you, it, it drives me more towards actually getting people more interested in understanding what's the appropriate metrics, how do we measure it better, and then how do we actually determine its impact. That's a field 
that I think is actually ripe as we're moving ahead. So for me, I actually think that ignoring social determinants of health, ignore what we've been doing for the last 50 years, right? I mean, it, it says that, well, we, we still start making comments like, well, you do know that African-Americans are just more predisposed to, to cancer or predisposed to diabetes or predisposed to hypertension. Predisposed, predisposed biologically or predisposed because of the structure that actually has an impact in the interplay on that biology. That's the question that I'm usually asking. And what makes people more comfortable is that, well, we don't want to think about that other stuff. That's too complicated. Well, unfortunately, I went into science because it was complicated to make it simpler, to make it more understandable. And I will not let what about isms. I will not let the phrase, well, it muddies the water or let the phrase it's complicated push us and keep us from doing the science. Had we done that, we never would have come up with immunotherapy. That was a hundred years. That wasn't just yesterday. It took a hundred plus years of people pushing it, putting it down to the side, pushing it before we actually got some breakthroughs. I feel the same thing is true as we're looking at how to integrate these social determinants um, in the context of our everyday science and particularly as it's impacting genetics and biological outcomes. Great. Yeah, I, fully agree. I think one of the hardest issues with moving beyond genetics and genetic epidemiology is recognizing that the epidemiology part is often a lot harder than the genetics part when we're sort of envisioning, envisioning the study design. How do you measure the environment? Well, it's a whole lot harder to measure than when you've got just a GWAS array that you can run across different individuals and get the same answer every time. Um, you can ask the same question to a bunch of different folks and you'll get different answers depending on how people are perceiving the question. So I think we need that epidemiology uh, field to inform how we're asking the questions and uh, sort of designing more systematic studies. One thing I love about the UK Biobank design is that it so systematically measured genetics, but also it asked the same questions of everybody in the same way. That gives us so much more insight into the environment than we're gonna get by amassing 10 studies that are all asking questions in slightly different ways to try to get at the same underlying issue. So I think we fundamentally need these big, systematically, reproducibly designed studies to be able to even enable the genetic epidemiology to move um, to a point where genetics currently is. Right. That is why I like the All of Us study at the beginning. I was very proud to be one of the initial PIs on that. Because I thought that, again, early days, but that we were starting to think about how to get information on larger scales. Um, and uh, I still have a lot of hope and uh, my fingers are always crossed that we make that go. Great. So both of you touched on this next question and there was a whole bold prediction that was focused on it, but it's a question that continues to be raised um, in this conversation. And so the question was, can speakers provide some guidance and perhaps definitions on the use of terms like race, ethnicity, and ancestry? Are there terms to be avoided? Uh, I'm gonna let Dr. Martin start with that one. And then I will come up with a couple of ideas about the last part of what you talked about. <laughs> um, we've try to define this and some try to define distinctions between these terms and some reviews we've written. So I, uh, there's a lovely review written by Roseanne Peterson and colleagues, uh, that sort of set up had in like a box one, what do we mean by ancestry, race, ethnicity? And in that box, it outlines that ancestry is purely determined by your genetics and by your ancestors. There's no social construct around um, around ancestry. That's in complete contrast to race and ethnicity. Um, these are influenced by how people self-identify and how people identify you. So how is society looking at you and thinking about you based on a whole bunch of different characteristics? Um, some of them physical, some of them cultural, some of them language, a whole bunch of different factors. And these differ depending on where you're at in the world. Um, the way people define Asian or treat the Asian ethnicity in the UK versus in the US is very different. Um, and that's driven also by who is there and who has been there and the historical context around, uh, around that. Um, 
that's a very broad, rough answer, but this is also a really contentious, I think, area that social scientists and geneticists are not likely to come to a whole lot of consensus on from having this out there a lot of conversations with folks about how we might define these terms. Um, it's also, you know, not up to any one group of geneticists. It's not up to any one group of social scientists. Um, what is race? What is ethnicity? And, and I, you know, so let me let me try it to take a stab at this by saying you need them both. They both turn out are important. The ancestry and genetics, as we talked about with triple negative breast cancer, uh, say in, in uh, you know, women from Eastern, uh, more of an Eastern ancestry versus Western ancestry in, in the outcomes, important. But it's also important to know that if race is a social construct, it's a construct that creates a space and place as if we were back in the old days of isolation and distance that there's environmental and these pressures that are actually on your DNA. I think that we shouldn't shriek away because it's difficult to understand that the structures that some people decided to build on their own, or in this case, just picking on African-Americans that the African-Americans are structures that were built. You know, the federal, the redlining issues were built. That was came out of politics, policies and economics. The interstate highway or urban renewal were programs that were built, right? That had an impact on certain communities. So to take away the context of the race and ethnicity and being able to understand the context. You know what I love about science is I've actually gotten to recognize that in science, what I really love is that we're good at building content, but we don't always have the context in which that is existing. And so I really think that having both understanding ancestry and genetics allows me to actually have insight into one aspect, but allowing me to actually have a better understanding of structure, place and space and the impact, which is the, the science that's still evolving. I think over time, if we stick with it, we will actually have at least a better understanding today of how that may actually play a role. Um, and then, by the way, of how we can intervene to make things better. But, you know, I know that that's thinking bold and getting out there, but I'm just saying that I think over time that the more we stick with this, the better information we'll have on both sides. And I really believe that we'll have the better chances of making the appropriate intervention interventions for communities, for peoples and for our society. Right. So we're coming to the close and I want to give each of you a, a minute or so to to reflect on any last comments that you would like to share uh, with the audience. So framing around this bold prediction, individuals from ancestrally diverse backgrounds will benefit equitably from the advances in human genomics. Last comments you wanna reflect on for the audience. Dr. Martin. Yeah, so for uh, genetic technologies to be translated and advance society equitably, we can't just stop at genetics. We of course need to move beyond that. I think that's the key takeaway that both Dr. Wynn and I came to. We need to consider more than just genetics. We need to consider the environmental context, the social constructs in which we all live. Um, and so I am really excited about this bold prediction. I think the bolder ambition would be that genetics helps us uh, frame our epidemiological studies to move beyond just genetics and to incorporate in a systematic way um, aspects of the environment. Great. So Dr. Wen? I think I would end on, I just have to applaud the NHGIR for both the courage, boldness, and insight of understanding how this tool over time can actually bring science closer to the community and how it can impact it favorably. Um, if I sound optimistic, I am. <laughs> because I really do think we're ushering in without even knowing it, the real convergent science of bringing different people with different voices together and answering the big problem of our time in a manner that we hadn't done or hadn't thought about 50 years ago. So I'm optimistic. Great, thank you. So Dr. Gunter, it's back to you. Thank you so much. Thank you to Vince for joining us. And thank you to Alicia and Rob for joining us as well. I knew this was gonna be a great seminar. I really appreciate both of you being bold enough to take this on and go out with us and, and, and think about all these issues and not being afraid to give us your opinions. 
And we really appreciate that. I can't believe it, but this is the ninth out of 10. We have one more left and that is January 10th. I encourage you all to join us for that. And that is going to be about uh, application of genetics to therapies. And again, you can watch any of the previous full predictions and you'll be able to watch this one shortly after it was done. So uh, the 230 of you that joined us today, we really appreciate you being here. And thank you again and uh, have a good rest of the week. Thank <laughs> you.